I want to first start out by acknowledging that Brendan, our longtime tenant here, a longtime uh, member of the uh, WSR Wild Seas Ranch community, for those who don't know, uh, is leaving for Miami on Friday. So I want to give him this going away present. Aww. Aww. And anyone who knows his last name, other than you, shout it out. Dragon. Dragon. <laughs> what? Come on. Okay. No way. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. Show it up to the camera. <laughs> the camera? Yeah. Nice. Thank you so much, Chris. I think it's a few. Uh, I think, I think so too. <laughs> wow, thank you so much. This is so cool. Oh. Right, right. What? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's not. I'll pay you bank. <laughs> <laughs> What's the thing on the bottom? Windstone edition? You mean one? his leg? The dragon's. It's an opening? Oh. I didn't say anything. You, that was all you. <laughs> okay. Oh Thank you so That's much, Chris. This is incredible. Oh. Thank you so much. All right. So let's start right. this uh, interesting talk. He was the, uh, actually Brendan was the one who uh, motivated me to do this talk um, oh because he was interested in the subject, and I said. Well, hopefully there'll be some other people, and there were. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we're kind of a metaphysical group here, and we want to know about truth and freedom and uh, ancient history and uh, what's been going on on this planet so that we can make it better. And, you know, starting from a point of truth really helps. And it's kind of been what my whole life has been about, actually. That's why I got into documentary films, and uh, covered some fringe subjects, you know, which I believe the evidence is overwhelming, that despite whatever the mainstream media may say, that we are being visited and we have an ancient past, which uh, unfortunately is still being uncovered, but there's a lot of things that are pointing to humanity uh, being a lot older and civilizations that preceded our civilization for many, many thousands, if not even hundreds of thousands of years. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to show you a couple of film clips. Um, and we'll watch these film clips. And these are both taken from documentaries, but I highlighted the things that I thought were most important and took out some of the things that weren't important. So the one that says opening, we'll start with that. and. Uh, you know, if these are short films, I think the first one's maybe 12 minutes or something. Atlantis. Many believe that it was a vast maritime empire whose influence was so great that remnants of his culture and legacy are found worldwide to this very day. Theories of its location and description are boundless. Archaeological interpretation of Atlantis suggests that it was placed someplace in the western Mediterranean. I believe the heart of Atlantis was in Costa Rica. Atlantis exists only in the minds of creative writers and thinkers. Antarctica was at one point in a temperate area, and that's where uh, uh, Atlantis was. Is Atlantis a myth, or like ancient Troy, is it a lost civilization waiting to be discovered? Fable or fantasy? Fact or fiction? For almost three millennia, mankind has been fascinated by stories of Atlantis. philosopher Plato, called the greatest thinker of his time, committed to paper a history of a legendary lost continent. The exact origins of the Atlantis legend are obscure, 
It is believed that the story was passed down to Plato from Socrates and a poet named Salon, who learned of the vanished culture from an Egyptian priest. In Timaeus and Critias, the two dialogues that he devoted to Atlantis, Plato left us with a detailed and comprehensive description of the land itself. His eloquent words serve as a map for an intrepid explorer to follow. The island of Atlantis was in the ocean, opposite the Pillars of Hercules, and was larger than Libya and Asia combined. Midway along the longest side, next to the sea, there was a large, level, rectangular plain. It was enclosed by mountains and high above the level of the ocean. It contained volcanoes and was prone to earthquakes and floods. The mountains contained gold, silver, copper, tin, and a natural alloy of copper and gold called orichalcum. The plain had a system of large and small canals, as well as natural hot and cold springs. The land was fertile and its crops abundant. On the plain, there was a capital city which was surrounded by concentric rings of land and water. The city was encompassed by a wall of red, white, and black stone. From Plato's perspective in Greece, Atlantis would have existed in the Atlantic Ocean. As a result, the majority of searches for the lost continent have until now focused on the ocean floor. This monument is one of a category of monuments from all over the world. These monuments have certain things in common. First and foremost, enormous blocks of stone, gigantic, weighing hundreds of tons. Secondly, very precise, scientific astronomical alignments. And thirdly, the greatest mystery of all, we don't know who built these monuments. Hancock points to a number of sites throughout the world which exhibit gigantic stone construction. This is called megalithic architecture. The immense fortress of Sacsayhuaman in Peru is comprised of individual granite stones, some weighing 360 tons. That's the equivalent of two diesel locomotives. The Osirian in Egypt is made of tremendous pillars of red Aswan granite, some of which weigh over 100 tons. My own view is that what we're looking at here is a common influence that touched all of these places long before recorded history began. A remote third party civilization unidentified by historians that had a presence in Mexico, that had a presence in South America, that had a presence in Egypt and elsewhere, and that left behind a legacy of knowledge in all of those places. Up on the Bolivian Altiplano lies the ancient city of Tiwanaku, thought by some to be the oldest city in the world. It may be the only visible remnant of the Ten Kingdoms of Plato's Atlantis. It has been said that the people in Tiwanaku seem to have followed on from a lost, missing culture, and uh, this culture is undoubtedly the culture of Atlantis because Tiwanaku would appear to have followed on from where Atlantis left off. Is it possible, as Alan believes, the Tiwanaku became the caretaker to the legacy of Atlantis. When we look at the Altiplano, we find that there are independent city-states dotted all over the region. So probably there were at least 10 kingdoms of Atlantis. And the culture and the civilization around Tiwanaku is probably one of the most prominent. If these theories are true, it could mean that a portion of Atlantis has literally been hiding in plain sight. Recent findings amongst the ruins of Tiwanaku have shed new light on ancient civilizations that could change long-held beliefs about the history of Earth itself. So Graham Hancock's point of view is similar to my point of view, is that there was a worldwide civilization sometime in the ancient past, and I'll give you a little bit more of a timeline of what that could be, uh, as we move through this, um, where essentially there was an advanced technological civilization similar in many ways to our own. Perhaps it was uh, crystal-based more so than metal and uh, 
you know, we're getting there too. We're starting to use crystals more. So I think there's going to be a situation where over time uh, and over all these new discoveries that are coming about, for instance, there's pyramids now discovered in China. In um, Alaska, there's a huge pyramid. Most people don't know about, unless you follow some of the more arcane researchers that are out there. There's uh, uh, pyramids in, um, where was it? Uh, well, there's always pyramids, new pyramids being discovered all over the planet. Uh, I'll think of you know, the different locations. Um, but they're not just in Mexico and Egypt now. They're all over the place. Um, sometimes they're mistaken for mountains because they're so overgrown. But then when archaeologists go in and check it out, they find that there's passageways and blo megalithic blocks once you clear off the vegetation. Um, so that's one indicator, and we'll get into some of that too with the next video. And uh, the, the next video actually was made by uh, Walt Disney a few years ago. The Walt Disney Company, when they uh, came out with a movie, an animated feature about Atlantis, and I took out the juicy parts and left all the marketing parts away. So yeah, go ahead and show that now. There are myths and legends and even writings by the great philosopher Plato that suggest that at some point in the Earth's distant past, the sun did not rise across a vast empty ocean, but instead spread its golden morning light on a land that was equally golden, Atlantis. Atlantis was a sophisticated civilization that existed about, in modern terms, 9600 BC. For Plato, Atlantis was, as he describes it, a holy island. This was a perfect civilization. It was the best and the brightest of Earth at that time. Uh, it was certainly an advanced civilization. The way I envision Atlantis uh, is quite as Plato described it something of an Eden on Earth. It's filled with exotic animals. He describes elephants, for example, in particular. Abundant elephants were on Atlantis. It's a very prosperous civilization with hot and cold running springs and every conceivable kind of fruit and vegetable growing there. So it was very close to being a, a perfect place to live. Plato wrote of an island empire on the other side of the ocean which he described as having a huge plain, as having a city placed at the centre of that plain, but on a southerly part, and that it was surrounded on three sides, to the north, to the west, and to the east, by mountain ranges. And they took this plain, and then they built a great city in it, and they built a, a series of concentric canals. And these canals ultimately led from the ocean until you finally reached an inner city that was the great capital of Atlantis, where the big buildings were and great pillars. And they built these enormous temples, one of which was described as being a mile and a half on one side. With gold statues, they had silver. The palace was covered in gold and in ivory and in silver and other kinds of rare exotic stones. While Plato's description of Atlantis is very specific, the really big question hasn't been quite so easy to answer. The actual location of Atlantis. Plato gave various clues as to the location of Atlantis. He said it existed in the Atlantic itself, beyond his own world, beyond the so-called Pillars of Hercules that marked the exit of the Mediterranean. He said that the island of Atlantis was reached in ancient times by voyagers, mariners from his own world. And he said that they used Atlantis to reach what he describes as the opposite continent. So is it possible that he is suggesting that it wasn't far from the Americas? Now how did Plato know to place Atlantis in front of this opposite continent? Since he was writing 2,000 years before the Americas were supposedly discovered by Columbus. To think that there was an advanced civilization that uh, had the ability to navigate the oceans and then vanished is not that out of the ordinary. People that are alleged to have been part of the Atlantis civilization were considered to be reasonably well advanced even by today's standards. We have evidence of sea travel 10,000 years ago. 
in some locations in the Mediterranean. Were there transatlantic voyages long before historians have led us to believe? Proving that is the first step to proving the existence of Atlantis, and compelling evidence is found on both sides of the Atlantic. We can follow the, the shadow of Atlantis, shall we say, around the world, and some of that evidence is within megalithic buildings. We know uh, for a certainty that there were pyramids, of course, on both sides of the ocean that were very similar. When you go and you see ancient Egypt or the massive monuments in Peru or Mexico, they're, they're awe-inspiring. They're building out of giant blocks of stone. One of the similarities is they were built without any mortar in between the bricks. There's a type of construction known as keystone cuts. Keystone cuts is a very unusual way of fitting giant blocks together where each block has got an hourglass or a T-shaped cut in it on each side of the block and then metal is poured into both sides of these clamps. We find it, curiously, all over the world. Also, the alignment, you know, the pyramids are aligned astronomically. How much do these people on both sides of the ocean know about astronomy? Apparently a great deal. What's one of the things that is critical to navigation? The path of the stars. It's the way seafarers have for thousands of years been able to navigate their way across the oceans. There was a Roman terracotta head that's almost 2,000 years old, found in controlled excavation in the 1930s near Mexico City. How did it get there? This seems to be hard evidence that someone was uh, crossing the Atlantic long before Columbus. On both sides of the Atlantic, there are very unusual rituals and customs that aren't easily explained. Mummification is another custom that we find in both Egypt, in South America, and in Central America. Atlantis has been the realm of psychics and mystics for scores of years. Today, with all of the new discoveries, we're beginning to see that Atlantis may not have been a magical place with people in flowing white gowns sailing around in UFOs. I think more realistically, Atlantis would have been the hub or the economic powerhouse of a whole variety of culture groups that were in existence at the end of the last ice age. I think it's egotistical of us to think that there weren't earlier civilizations. Every new discovery either takes us farther out, farther out in space, or farther back, farther back in time to prove something that we thought inconceivable only a minute ago. And I think when we get all the way back, you know, Atlantis will be proved conclusively. Often the way we construct the past is the way we perceive the past and ancient peoples to be. We naturally think of them as primitive people who don't have the wheel, don't have electricity. Archaeologists have now proven that that is largely wrong. There's considerable debate about just how advanced the civilizations that are alleged to be Atlantis may have been. But you know, there is ample evidence that people were not dumb. Many of the elements in the Atlantis story, for example, reminds one of Egyptian civilization. Technologically, I think among the most um, outstanding aspects of this, they were moving these large multi-ton blocks, systematically stacking them to form the pyramids. These giant blocks of stone are so huge, even modern cranes couldn't lift those stones. And engineers really have no explanation on how they were moved. Not only did the ancients build these remarkable structures, they also outfitted them with some very modern conveniences. They found plumbing, if you will. I mean, you know, and this is 1500 BC we're talking about here. Hot and cold water flowing um, for their convenience, in some cases apparently what were flushing toilets. Wooden toilet seats, you know, touches out of Martha Stewart. Perhaps even more amazing is evidence of one of the most modern inventions, electricity. What they found in ancient Iraq were common bronze or copper articles that had been electroplated with gold. If they were doing that, they had to have some way to generate an electric current. And that brings us to a very interesting item, sometimes known as a Baghdad battery, which was found some years ago in Iraq. And it's this little jar which has um, a copper cylinder in it and an iron rod. Turns out, when you make a model of it, filled with vinegar or some kind of other weak acid, it actually generates an electric current. There are reliefs at the Hathor Temple in Dendera in Egypt, which appear to be electric lights and batteries. 
Another surprising piece of evidence that points to ancient electricity is that in the darkest recesses of the pyramid's tombs, there is no proof of illumination by torches. There's no carbon on the walls. Yet, intricate hieroglyphs are painted on the ceilings and on the walls, but there is no evidence of any kind of a flame. Egyptologists are at a loss to explain this. Historians and scientists are also at a loss to explain this next incredible discovery. On Easter in 1900, sponge divers off a small island in the Aegean called Antikythera went to a shipwreck and pulled a small metal box out of it. And in fact, it's been vindicated as absolutely being from over 2,000 years ago. American scientists studying this box decided it was a computer. What it was probably doing was computing planetary positions, lunar positions, solar positions, uh, phases of the moon. It was a navigation device. It's far more complicated than any Swiss clock. It was the kind of device that modern archaeologists were so amazed by what they found. They said that finding this device was like finding a jet airplane in the tomb of King Tut. Even the idea of a jet airplane in King Tut's tomb isn't that far-fetched, when you consider the petroglyphs of South America. Why would the ancients have created something only visible from the air, unless they were capable of some form of flight? Well, I think ultimately what we're going to find is that the um, skin-clad, stone tool wielding caveman idea of the last ice age is totally incorrect. Ever since Plato first wrote of Atlantis, explorers have been coming the earth in search of the lost continent. Their journey has taken them from mountain tops to ocean bottoms. And while our expeditions may not have actually discovered Atlantis, they have uncovered amazing proof of its existence. According to Plato, Atlantis sank in a, a catastrophic event. The story of Atlantis is a story of an ideal civilization that lost its way. They got wayward. They, they, they started to be debased, if you will. Um, they, they tried to conquer other places. They became decadent. They became arrogant in themselves, and this was part of their downfall. So Plato said that the gods brought this cataclysm upon Atlantis to punish that civilization for its rapacious ways. Atlantis has been placed all over the world. Some of the top places for Atlantis and locations are the Azores in the mid-Atlantic, the Atlantic has been the Atlantic since at least 450 BC. One popular location for Atlantis has been the Greek island of Santorini or Thera, an island that literally blew up. It fits in, in some ways in the sense that it was destroyed in a single catastrophic event. On Santorini, as the island is now known, there were remnants of the Minoan civilization. They were extremely extraordinarily advanced, they were artistically creative, and there were many anthropologists, archaeologists, mythologists who tried to take the information about the Minoan civilization and say, ha, this is what Plato was talking about. There's a lot of problems with Thera being Atlantis, I think. It was 900 years as opposed to 9,000 years before Plato. It also is not outside the pillars of Hercules, which most people believe were the Straits of Gibraltar. Okay. That was so interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's just the top of the tip of the iceberg. Um, there's so much more in-depth stuff, and I was studying uh, Atlantis as a, as a subject for uh, a feature film that I wrote back in I don't know 79, 80, <laughs> in that era. And um, these are all the books that I've accumulated, and I've read uh, most every one of these. Um, you're welcome to come up and look, you know, at some of these here, as many as you want afterwards. Um, all these things, and a lot of these uh, books are not just about Atlantis, but about other enigmas from the past that we can't really surmise, so it gets into the 
like the ancient astronaut theories of visitations from extraterrestrials impacting uh, mankind in terms of our DNA, our evolutionary uh, capabilities, and our civilizations as well. Um, so, but getting back to the subject at hand, Atlantis, uh, as I've been able to surmise over the years, was a global civilization that may have started out in a small area, like they say here, which was an island, um, and then expanded to all the other countries in the world and set up outposts and different kinds of colonies, uh, a lot of which ended up in Egypt and Greece, and then on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, Mexico, Yucatan, for instance, and, and Peru, and a lot of other areas in South America. So South America is also an area where a lot of people have um, sighted uh, Atlantis. Um, the Antarctica one's very interesting and actually has a lot of uh, bearing too because many people believe that the Earth was on a different axis many thousands of years ago. But what I found out while I was re researching uh, all the many uh, theories on Atlantis was that there really was some sort of civilization going on perhaps as much as a, a million years ago. And there have been these continuous cycles of civilizations that have risen to a great height and then were destroyed. And, and of course, you know, to a lot of these uh, archaeologists and historians, anthropologists and so forth, uh, they just say those are myths and legends because we don't have any physical, hard physical evidence. Well, the thing is, even stainless steel will deteriorate after 10,000 years. So outside of megalithic structures, there's really not too many things that will last uh, over the course of 10,000 years. So, we, so, so one of the things I also studied was uh, the psychic Ed, Edgar Casey, and we'll be showing more about him as well and what he uh, uh, predicted. But how many here are familiar with Edgar Casey's works? Just, just a two, okay, and one online. <laughs> 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 Uh, Edgar Casey was a psychic back in the 40s, basically, who did a lot of readings for different people, and he actually healed over 14,000 people that came to him. Can you imagine that? 14,000 people. Uh, he did readings which um, helped them overcome different diseases, uh, and then he also did these other readings about you know, ancient uh, civilization. And he talked about Lemuria a little bit as well. Lemuria, or Mu, was something that was discovered. Uh, I wouldn't say it was discovered, but it was uh, through various legends down through the centuries, it was claimed that there was a gigantic civilization in the Pacific. Um, mm. From everything I've researched, it even uh, preceded Atlantis. And uh, there's a lot of interesting, uh, I don't want to overload you with factoids and things like that, but there's a lot of interesting evidence that Lemuria, also called Mu, M-U, was the quote, motherland from which humanity sprang. Um, and um, so, you know, over the course of many, many hundreds of thousands of years, people, of course, migrated into different areas and knowledge was preserved or not preserved sometimes. Um, and uh, Atlantis, according to Edgar Cayce, uh, had three distinct periods. And one was going back to 10 million years ago, <laughs> according to him. And, and he uh, indicated that that was when spirit actually incarnated into material form. That before then on the earth, 
there was no real spirit. Uh, there was no real life, essentially. And that the, um, the beings, very highly advanced beings, wanted to know what being in a material body was like. So they incarnated. And it's a fascinating story if you ever want to read about what Edgar Casey has to say. I'm not going to get into that because it's 10 million years ago. It doesn't have as much uh, relevance to what I'm talking about with regards to the rest of the Atlantis theory. But the next period was about 200,000 years ago when, according to Edgar Casey, the spirit uh, that did devolve or involve into the material world actually formed uh, the polarity of male and female. And that to me was very fascinating. Um, so that began kind of like the whole biblical thing that began uh, um, the, the time in which Atlantis really started to be uh, built up as a Garden of Eden, as a paradise. And we existed for many thousands of years in that state. Um, the third period is what you call the modern period, the period, oh, but by the way, that, that eventually came to a destruction time as well. But it happened slowly. So a lot of people were able to get away. It wasn't kind of like, you know, a total catastrophe. It happened over the course of many hundreds of years, and it reduced um, a lot of the land masses into islands scattered all over the place. So this last period, the third period of Atlantis, is the one that many scholars have focused on because there's more evidence, obviously, of it. Um, and that ended approximately 12,000 years ago. Uh, and there's a lot of geological evidence scattered all around the world, and including all the flood myths that point to that time period in which Atlantis or humanity went through this huge deluge, you know, that uh, basically um, there's theories of how that came about. Some are comets, for instance. There's a theory that um, uh, the dinosaurs were wiped out of, around that time, that they're, they were, you know, they were millions of years old, and they, they'd been wiped out in a number of other ways as well. So there weren't many dinosaurs left by then. Even though there are archaeological remnants that have been shown to depict men and dinosaurs living on the, at the same time, which is not what we're told. <laughs> you know, we, we were told that dinosaurs we were long gone before mankind came, came on scene. Uh, but basically, um, what I've found through uh, the works of people that do um, like these um, deep dives into uh, lost art, archaeology, lost civilizations, artifacts. They often call them objects out of place in time and space, where you find, for instance, a metal nail. That's an exact working metal nail, and it's embedded in a piece of fossilized coal that had to be several million years ago, right? They, all these things appear. Some of them end up in the Smithsonian in a back room somewhere, you know. <laughs> Like in Raiders of the Lost Ark, they put them in the big uh, giant uh, warehouse at the end of the day and say, see you later. <laughs> the public will never find out about this stuff. So, um, but you know, a lot of times, especially when I was growing up and reading these kinds of books, there was a lot of openness and a lot of curiosity among a lot of people worldwide as to... Um, what was really the truth about our ancient past? Um, because, you know, there, there's, there's always going to be controversy, but back then there was more of a, there was less censorship, let's put it that way. You can go into almost any bookstore, and even libraries, some public libraries sometimes, had a lot of this material readily available to check out. Um, Ironically, I went and did a lot of research at the library in Los Angeles, the main library, before it got burned down. And so a lot of those books are lost forever. Uh, but there were interesting books there about uh, different archaeological expeditions 
to the Yucatan and other places in Peru, for instance. And those are one one of the kind of books that are, you know, rapidly disappearing. So um, I want to show some of the slides here now. The, the, the one on the top is an ancient map, which showed, this was like in the time of uh, Ptolemy. So we're talking about, you know, Egyptian and Greek uh, hybrid civilization. So probably, I don't know if you can see it over here if I'm blocking you or whatever. Okay, but they go back, you know, this goes back very long ago. And um, it does show uh, this at, that they knew about Atlantis being in the Atlantic Ocean. And this was a time when the geological records do show that the Atlantic Ocean, all oceans around the planet, were at about 300 feet lower than they are now. So, because when the Great Flood occurred, a lot of that was the melting of the ice caps and, and you know, just a number of other uh, similar kind of um, snowballing effects that happened. The, the sea levels rose at a very uh, high level. The bottom picture there, too, is more modern interpretation of what that map and other maps similar show. So next. Yeah, this was Ptolemy's map of the world in the Middle Ages. And so um, a lot of this stuff was only known to like people high up in the Church of Rome, you know, or uh, because like the Alexandria Library was burned many times too, so a lot of this information, only only a portion of it, got sent off to uh, Rome, whereas the rest of it just got destroyed. So there's believed to be many many more uh, records, um, and every now and then we come across one. There's one that's mysteriously discovered, and it's like okay, this says this and. You know, but there's no hard evidence. It's, it, it could still be classified as a myth. So it doesn't get any scholarly attention. Next. This is the one they showed in a lot of those videos. Actually, in this case, Africa is like from the south instead of the north. So Spain is here, Africa is there, America's over here. So flip it upside down and if you, if you can't you know, think in terms of the world being, <laughs> having, you know, the opposite of north and south. Um, and then this is the city that they talked about here. Oh, and that, that's a very interesting concept. There's actually this book that came out. Isaac Asimov actually wrote the forward to it. It's called Atlantis Illustrated. And it's based on Plato's writings. Now, Plato gave really exact measurements. If he was just doing an allegory about, you know, humanity losing its way and getting destroyed, why would he go into all these real minute specifics about, you know, how many stadia were, you know, running north and south and all these details about the architecture and the way the city was laid out it just doesn't make any sense. So I think Plato, his um, writings were very, um, um, he was talking about something that had both an allegorical meaning and was literal. You know, for many years, people didn't believe that Troy was real. They thought that was a story from the Iliad, from Homer's Iliad, and look what happened. Heinrich Schliemann, back at the turn of the, you know, uh, 19th century and into the 20th century, he mounted an expedition, used the Iliad as a fact-finding uh, uh, piece of information to locate the actual findings of Troy, and, and he found it, and it's there, and it's history. Um, so I believe the same is true with Atlantis. Um, go ahead and show the next one. Now, this is like a cutaway. Okay, here's Spain. Here are the Azores. This is the ocean level now. Here's the Bermuda. And then this is uh, how deep the Atlantic Ocean is. Now, it's not to perfect scale. 
but back in the 18, late 1800s, they actually had ships which measured the depth of the Atlantic Ocean all the way from one continent to the other. And so uh, this author here, Ignatius Donnelly, he wrote this book called Atlantis, the Antediluvian World. He's one of the best known authors because he puts together just a comp compendium of incredible amounts of scientific information and mythologies and legends from different indigenous peoples. Um, it's just mind-blowing. And I read this thing and I just went, wow. You know, it's like, this guy did his research. But a lot of people thought he was a, a nutcase at the time. Didn't believe him. Um, but it started uh, getting attention over the years as time went on because it was hard to disprove everything. They could disprove one or two things, but the body of evidence there is just overwhelming. All the different types of similarities there that would have been found in the archaeological record between Mayan and Egyptian and some of these other cultures is just mind-blowing. You would just have to come to the conclusion that at the height of the last Atlantis, um, there was uh, a civilization which basically was worldwide. And, you know, um, the Bible has, of course, not only Noah's flood story, but has all these other stories uh, which kind of indicate that Atlantis may have really been there. They talk about giants and things like that. So, and, and some authors really get into the aspect about giants. I don't want to get into that right now because there's, you know, that's another, you know, sidetrack that we can get into. Just want to mention one thing that giant bones and skeletons have been found worldwide, and there have been photos taken, especially in the 1800s, and um, all those bones have disappeared or have been confiscated. Mm. All of them, mm. just about. So somebody out there who's controlling the world doesn't want us to know <laughs> there was this other world with giants and other types of people. Um, so next slide. I, I don't know if it, that might be the last. Okay, so this is the, an artist or an AI's version of interpreting, interpreting the uh, capital city of Atlantis with the concentric rings of uh, canals and land and the, the big temple in the center. Now you could also say, well, that's an allegory. And indeed it is. But there, back in the ancient past, especially during the uh, matriarchal tribal societies, they consistently built their cities in circles. It's only we in the last few hundred years that started building uh, rectangular cities, rectangular layouts for our villages. Yeah. And this, the, so the temple in the center is that like uh, a government or like a church type? It's thing? it's more like a, a both. It's both in a way, but it's it's basically a theocracy is what they had. So they had people who were priests, and then they would go in there, but they had you know different kind of government. Uh, functions that were separate from that. So, um, but you see, here's the thing when you talk about something like this. It evolved over to hundreds and hundreds and maybe even thousands and thousands of years. So you had different souls incarnating, right? And they led the civilization to heights of spiritual and intellectual and technological achievement. And then, you know, like all things happen in this, you know, humanity-based world we live in, the 3D world, they, people get spoiled and then they get greedy and then they develop ways in which to attract all the money to them, kind of like what's going Doesn't on now. Doesn't sound familiar. <laughs> and uh, they devolve into this kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, dark energy that then, starts reinforcing uh, nature's pushback because nature doesn't want that or you know goddess doesn't want that or god doesn't want that whatever 
And what happens is, is that uh, they kind of bring it, bring on a destruction of themselves. And how we're kind of like reaching that point too, because even back then there are all sorts of stories about chimeras and different kinds of hybrid beings that were created back then um, between animals and man. And um, we're doing that right now with the genetic experimentation and you know cloning and all sorts of other things. So um, and Edgar Casey and other psychics have said that a lot of the people reincarnating here in the 20th century and 21st century are souls that wanted to go through this experience again to get it right and not end Amen. up, you know, destroying. <laughs> but there's Can we still get some more of them, please. Yeah, you know, a refund. But they, yeah, yeah. At least they had utopia. Yeah. <laughs> they had it for a while. They, yeah, they had it for a while. Um, but utopia is something that, you know, it's, it's always in the future, right? It's a, we would think, okay, well, it's like an ideal to go for. Mm -hmm. and, and so this was, di this is different. This is an ideal that we had, like this was a golden age we had. Um, and astrologically, there have been people who, you know, really explained how that uh, comes about, that we go through these great, cycles, uh, like 26,500 years, uh, in the ecliptic, that, um, uh, where we go through the 12 zodiacal signs. So we're coming into the age of Aquarius, which is supposed to be more positive and usher in a thousand years of peace and things like that. So hopefully, hopefully, right? Um, are there any other questions right now? What? Yeah. This illustration reminds me of what I've seen of a lake outside of maybe Mexico City that was right. the Aztec's capital city, so the conquistadors invaded. Tenochtitlan. In, right, and it was a whole floating city, but right. the illustrations I've seen look a lot like that. Yeah, yeah. and if you look at the word Atlan, A-T-L in the Nahuatl language um, means water. So um, there's a lot of similarities linguistically between different uh, civilizations that we were told never had any, uh, that were isolated from each other, right? Mm -hmm. Edgar Casey was a 19th century American psychic. In one of Edgar Casey's readings, he had predicted that Atlantis would begin rising in 1968 or 1969. And he was also very specific about where. And he's the one who said it would arrive in Bimini. Coincidentally, in 1968, the Florida archaeologist was going to the island of Bimini and saw from an airplane underwater what is now known as the Bimini Road. And from that date on, the Bimini Road has become famous and associated with that land. Since its discovery beneath the shallow water, the Bimini Road has sparked intense debate. Some believe it is not a road, but a dock. Others who have dived the site claim that the stones are actually set on top of other smaller stones buried beneath the sand. To them, this suggests a temple or Stonehenge-like structure. In the center of the screen, you can see underwater a J-like structure composed of thousands of blocks, rectangular and square. The Bimini Wall, or road as it has become known, is not a natural formation. Famous American psychic Edgar Cayce predicted that Atlantis would rise in 1968 or 69. In 1968, a small group of divers were diving for lobster where they and many before them had worked countless times previously. Suddenly, they discovered these extraordinary stone structures. The structures have been there for centuries, but covered with sand. With time's shifting of the sand, it rose in 1968, and scientist Dr. Mason Valentine had the good sense to know that they weren't just beach rock, but perhaps part of a huge man-built complex. This unique structure is composed of huge blocks as big as 20 feet square and weighing several tons. Beneath this visible layer lie yet other layers of ancient blocks. Considering the depth of the water and the location, this extraordinary structure was presumably submerged 12,000 years ago 
which was approximately the time Atlantis was said to have vanished. The Bimini Road is not the only controversial discovery on the island. From the air, large land formations bear a striking resemblance to ancient petroglyphs found in South America, such as this image of a shark and this of a seahorse. To be honest, there is no firm solution as to what these early structures are. The geologists will hold that they're natural. The atlantologists hold that they are archeological features. And in a way, I believe that they are not that important. The importance is that it drew others to start looking in the area of the Bahamas and the Caribbean. Now, why would the Caribbean be the most likely location for the seafaring people of Atlantis. If you leave the Mediterranean and enter the Atlantic, you're immediately pulled into this huge, great circular current, which flows in a clockwise direction. An island continent of Atlantis and the Caribbean would be an ideal situation to take advantage of these currents, and just as Columbus and other seafarers did, to, to naturally use them for seafaring. Coming and going to Mexico, to North America, to South America, to Africa, to Europe, to the Mediterranean. Sometime around 12,000 years ago, a comet appeared in the skies over the northwest of the United States. It was heading in a southeasterly direction. It would appear to have fragmented as it appeared to go low level right across the country like some huge millennial fireworks. And each piece would appear to have impacted with mostly the terrain of the eastern states. Evidence of this cometary impact can be seen in the thousands of craters known as the Carolina Bays. Additional evidence can be found in the legends of the Native and Central American Indians. They talk about the appearance of a fiery serpent in the sky causing mass devastation, causing floods that immediately drowned the islands. You've got a cataclysm by the ocean. You've got a flood. I definitely think a flood was part of the wiping out of Atlantis. Almost immediately, it would have caused tidal waves, which would have completely flooded all of the islands. Not only would flooding by water be devastating, but we're talking rising oceans of salt water, which nothing would survive. Plato's account of Atlantis is interesting because there are certain fact, uh, certain features of it that seem to tie into what we know as events that did actually occur around the end of the last ice age. We do know that there was a sudden environmental change. There was a dramatic change from the uh, ice age to modern warmer conditions and um, there was flooding. There were cataclysmic floods in a variety of locations across the globe. There was a massive extinction going on in the Americas. So we do have evidence of some kind of global catastrophe going on. What happened as the ice age ended is that global temperatures rose, major glaciers melted, sea levels rose several hundred feet. This flooded many coastal areas around the world. You can imagine an El Nino event times a million. I think the events that transpired at the end of the last ice age are part of the universal flood myth. The massive floodwaters covered all but the mountaintops of Atlantis, destroying all life caught in its devastating path. The ocean would eventually begin to recede, but never completely. The ice age glaciers melted by the cataclysm had permanently raised the level of the Earth's seas over 300 feet, the height of a 30-story building. Gone forever beneath the waves was the city of Atlantis. Gone forever was the lush, fertile plain. And when the water subsided, what remained of Atlantis is what remains today. Cuba. No other island in the Atlantic fits Plato's description of Atlantis so completely. The mountain ranges that block the cold winds from the north, protecting the vast plain now known to be covered by the southern bay. Mel Fisher, the man who found the sunken Spanish treasure ship, the Atosha, 
claimed that he had actually located the lost city of Atlantis. There's only been one small group that's actually gone to the site, my dad and a few other people. And um, what we believe we found is the capital city, the center location, palace. We try to be very low key. We don't want to draw a lot of attention to it. And right now, if we went in, it would be totally confiscated because of the government there. And even more recently, Reuters News Service reported this discovery by Advanced Digital Communications, the Canadian research team responsible for locating the sunken USS Maine. While searching for sunken treasure ships, ADC actually discovered what may be the remains of an ancient underwater city off the coast of Cuba. There we go. Okay. So, and then I think it's possible. Um, but once again, uh, if it's a worldwide civilization, you might have one large city here, yeah. one large city there, yeah. one large ancient city there. So, you know, Atlantis could be, it's, it's more like a concept of a civilization that mankind had back then. And, you know, like Lemuria could be, you know, parts of Malibu, could be parts of uh, Indonesia, the Hawaiian Islands, right? So, you know, in this case, you could take that off now. In, in this case, uh, I think, you know, we, we are going to have to probably wait, but eventually we're going to come to some conclusion uh, soon, hopefully, <laughs> maybe within the next 50 years, that we can finally say this was the capital city of that particular civilization, which was then later referred to as Atlantis. Because they may not call themselves Atlanteans. Um, they, you know, if you look at a picture like this, it's very Greek, you know, it's yeah. classical Greek, right? So that's kind of like the image that has been projected. Well, it could also be classical Peruvian, it could be classical mm -hmm. uh, Egyptian, uh, and it could be all of those things, in fact, because a civilization, you know, it's like going to Atlanta, Georgia and say, okay, this is representative of America. No, it's not. <laughs> It's just a representative of that locality, which happens to be in America. So ultimately, I think we're going to find more and more archaeological discoveries under the ocean. And like in, in South America, some of these things are going to be under dense vegetation. And we'll eventually, you know, get a bigger picture. But um, at this point in time, it's like, we just don't want to repeat the same mistakes they made that led to their destruction. That's the, that's the message I want to get across. <laughs> By knowing what they did, you know, when, when you have knowledge of what a previous civilization did to get themselves in trouble and destroy their civilization, you can then reflect upon what we've gone, got going on in the present and try to do things to alleviate that. If you don't know, then how are you going to... Wait, are you saying that we're going to learn from our mistakes? Some people will. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people will. But <laughs> only if the truth of the, of the past is admitted, you know. And like I say, there are tons of artifacts of giants' remains and things like that in Antarctica, that end up in the Smithsonian, or they end up in a back room somewhere, in some warehouse. Uh, yeah, somebody down there. Uh, somebody uh, on. You can mute. Hello. <laughs> you gotta see who that could be. Yeah. Mute them. Okay? Yeah. So, uh, our, situa our situation here on the planet is such that the more knowledge we have about who we are, I think will eventually allow us to become who we want to be. <clears throat> you know, and we're, we're not just a, a bunch of like evolved 
slime that came out of primordial ooze were something much more um, beautiful, much more um, of a reflection of our creators. And uh, I, having had a near-death experience, know that to be a fact, but a lot of people haven't had near-death experiences. Maybe we got to go through a near nuclear, mm. you know, warfare or mm. some other kind of near death experience collectively mm. as, as a society. If so, I hope most of us will get through it and learn from our mistakes, like you said, <laughs> and build something better. Mm. So, that's about, any other questions? Any? Uh, yeah. Have you seen the Forbes like doomsday map that predicts that Mu will actually appear again? Like, no, I have not. I've not seen Check that. Check it out. It's based on Edgar Casey's writing. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. By Forbes. Mm -hmm. Forbes. Huh? Yeah. Wow. So yeah, I'll check that out for sure. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Kim. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. What do you know anything about what their power source was? Like, yeah. 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 So I mentioned before that they probably had a technology that was more crystalline based. So uh, from what I've been reading, there were, Casey mentions it, it's called the Firestone, and that was being used to create energy, but then it was being misused uh, for warfare. Mm. Um, so I, I don't know all the details of how that may work. Other people have interesting theories. They Chris, the Chris clips, is, they said something about like vinegar and... Uh, yeah, that was, that was for the battery, for, cru oh. for the electricity. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was found in um, Iraq. Iraq. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but as far as the Atlantean civilization, I mean, it's described that they had flying vehicles. Okay? And of course, you know, we, if you know anything about the Upanishads and uh, Hindu culture, they call, uh, they believe that uh, the Vimyanas were flying vehicles that they had back thousands of years ago as well. And there's also evidence that there was a nuclear warfare uh, that went on, you know, uh, caused all kinds of interesting um, things in India uh, back then. Uh, Mohenjaro, I think was the name of it, where they found vitrified glass, which could only be attributed to a, a nuclear-like explosion. So there's 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 all these kinds of circumstantial evidence, right? And you know, the mainstream always wants to keep things like, okay, it's it's only natural. It's like those blocks, those bimini blocks, are natural. Okay, then how come we've hardly ever seen them anywhere else <laughs> on the whole planet? <laughs> um, I mean, come on. <laughs> I went to Bimini twice. Yeah. That's like an hour boat ride from Miami, yeah? A motorboat, but on a sailboat, it's like a 12 hour. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, you, did, yeah. you did it on a sailboat? Yeah. That's well, cool. We never got to see those because of a whole other source of things, but that was like super fascinating when. You started talking about Atlantis, I was like, oh, the Bimini Road. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Some people actually think that um, one of the crystal chambers there in that area is still putting out energy causing the Bermuda Triangle, oh. which may be a space-time portal. Oh. You know? What? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, do I believe that? I'm, I'm open-minded. I think you do. <laughs> you want to read Oh, yeah, yeah. Check it out. Check it out. <laughs> so so the he does. Yeah, yeah, it's a bestseller. <laughs> hey, what's up? What the thing is fascinating to me, too, is this uh, LiDAR, which is... Uh, Lasers they use to scan yeah, the jungle yeah, for big yeah, yeah, finding cool. all kinds of crazy cities down there. Now. Exactly. They've never been discovered before. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And National Geographic is like involved in that. They were yeah. involved with a lot of this stuff too. Um, but once again, you know, the academic industrial complex wants to keep a lid on all this stuff, doesn't want to conjecture. 
they just want to present it as all as if like oh it's no big deal you know that we're the most advanced we've ever been right now <laughs> right 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 yeah that's that's the thing there's an ar arrogance in all that you know and you see it in so many places you know i don't have to tell you about my feelings about government but uh yeah you just see it you know all, so many places um that you know it's hubris it's it's ego and you know it's largely getting us into all sorts of problems but uh, um, I think eventually the truth is going to win out you know and people will start uh, opening their eyes and and uh, looking around and wanting different answers you know um, but you know we have to be vigilant we can't just accept any old theory that comes along that's why I read all these books I wanted to get different people's perspectives. You know, some are more sensational than others. You got things like this. Mystery of Atlantis, Book One. Enigmatic Mysteries and Anomalous Artifacts of North America, a connection to the ancient past. So, you know, these are flashy colors and stuff. But you know, there's good little pieces of things here I've never found before that were interesting. And, um, you know, that's the thing about knowledge, it never ends. Your search for knowledge never ends. And um, after time, you could piece it together. You can make your own judgments. You can believe what you want to believe, right? And um, I don't force my opinion on anybody. I try to show them the facts as I've, I've learned them to be. Um, and I try to find the, the most uh, well-researched scholars that uh, do, in fact, um, know way more than me. So th that's how you have to approach this a lot of times, is not think that you know the answer after reading a couple of books or watching a lecture by Chris Toussaint. You got <laughs> sometimes you've got to dig in and uh, investigate and um, you know, come to your own conclusions. And uh, if I see it corroborated in multiple places, you know, then I have I, I give it more credibility. I don't say it's a God-given truth or anything. I just say, you know, it's more credible. And uh, I keep that in the back of my mind. So um, that's where I'm at with this. I haven't given a lecture like this in a long time. <laughs> Uh, especially about this subject. I used to give lectures in Hollywood about this uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, and mm -hmm. that was fun. Um, we had, you know, a good old slide projector, and we were projecting mm -hmm. slide images on the walls. So it was really fun. How much cocaine was involved? <laughs> What's cocaine? No. <laughs> I was I Hollywood in the calculating. 80s. Like, oh. calculating. <laughs> Once again, I didn't hang out in those Hollywood circles. Oh. <laughs> so, awesome. were Atlanteans humans? They were, yes. And depending on which era or epic or whatever of Atlanteans you were, you were either more spiritually more evolved spirit. and living in more harmony, more idyllic mm -hmm. situations, or you were going through, you know, a lot of the ego stuff and the, um, you know, duality, where you wanted to get on top of your fellow human beings and destroy them, and they went through that period too. They were creating all kinds of wars. They even, they even sent warships to Greece and the, Gre the Greeks fended them off and I believe that 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 was probably what spurred the Greeks on to really have their civilization prosper and you know they had they had to face the Persians as well so um, you know but they were all very human um, now, Edgar Cayce, the, the early Atlanteans, the ones going back millions of years, they were more spirits that just were curious about, you know, becoming material, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but we have very, other than, you know, readings from psychics and people like that, we 
channels. We don't really have much of an understanding about that far back in time. Right. So. So, is it kind of like a lost art situation where like there's Atlantean DNA still somewhere within the human civilization? Um. Yeah, I think there probably is. Um, but I think it's it's it. It doesn't matter so much now. Uh, what matters more, like, is what your um, soul's evolution has is. If you have a soul family connection to Atlantis, for instance, which I do believe I have. I mean, I, I was probably involved in more of the Mayan type. But I feel strongly connected to the Mayan civilization, for instance. So. Mm -hmm. um, not so much the Egyptian, but definitely the Mayan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think other people might feel more directed towards another culture. Um, I have a woman friend, and she's really into Persia and Iran and stuff like that, and she studies the language. And, and you know, she's a white girl from Pennsylvania, but she just has this soul connection to Persia. She's and, from Farsivania? Farsivania. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so that's it, I think. Yay! Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So you're welcome. I'm going to leave these books out for the rest of the night. You're welcome to look through them. And Thank you. If there's one you particularly want to check out, let me know. Yeah. But, um, I, and, and this is only books that I've bought that I own. I've read a lot of library books and things like that that I don't have. So. Cool. You did great. Nice. 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 Nice.